The views and content expressed on the following program are provided solely for informational and entertainment purposes. They do not constitute legal advice. A podcast is not a substitute for retaining a competent, licensed attorney to advise you on your specific legal situation. How's it going, everybody? Welcome to the show. It is time for Break the Business, where we empower indie creators and have some fun along the way. I'm Ryan Carella, and it is a pleasure to have you here this week. We got ourselves a program, viewers and listeners. It's going to be an absolute blast. So many great stories, and the people that we get to talk about those stories with, mwah, chef's kiss, good company, good content. It's going to be a fun hour for everyone involved and coming up in the second segment i'm excited for our guest that we're going to have this week speaking of great people to talk to we're going to be joined by music publicist sasha pisterman of sdp digital she's got a new course out called the complete music pr playbook i love talking to the publicist they always have the best advice they have the best information just by virtue of the fact that they have so many musicians walking in through their doors they work on so many campaigns they've seen it all from a promotional standpoint and so they always are great interviews i love chatting with them and i'm sure sasha is going to be no exception and speaking of people that we love chatting with our co-host this week a real treat to talk to elisa rock doc is here hey elisa yo what's up not much Hi. i got a i got a great deal of stories that i want to talk with you about but first i need your I need your pop culture expertise. I need your your PhD in pop culture that you have. That's not a joke, viewers and listeners. That's an actual PhD <laughs> that is on her wall. I don't know. That if it's is on not her what wall. the PhD says. It, it says is. I, 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 I checked it. My, yeah, we know what that means, though. <laughs> all of your your dissertation was all about pop culture, and so I I like to think that that it gives you a finger on the pulse of like slang and whatever's going on in pop culture, <laughs> such that like I feel like. You might be able to tell me what's going on with like Gen Z slide. We don't have any Gen Z co-hosts on Break the Business. So you're the closest thing I have to a Gen <laughs> Z co-host, ex except we're the same age. But like, I know you know this stuff better than I do. So I need you to explain something to me because I'm so oh. lost right now. I've never felt older than when I was scrolling through TikTok and watching this video of Mitski, who is about, you know, love Mitski. She's great. She's about to perform at a concert and she walks out on stage and the place is completely quiet. I guess she's trying to go for a dramatic entrance. Mm. And then just somebody in the crowd just shouts, mother is mothering. <laughs> and then the entire crowd just gets so angry with her. Like, shh, what are you like? Just so mad that she said that this person said that. So the two questions um, I have for you, two part sure. question. Yeah. One what the hell does mother is mothering mean and two why would somebody shouting mother is mothering at a mitski concert cause the entire attendees at that concert to get so angry with the person who shouted it explain please so i i'll, I'll start with the second question because i'm not entirely sure if maybe there are issues with a I'm not necessarily familiar with Mitski's pronouns and perhaps saying mother is mothering might have been misgendering them. Um, oh God, two, that, that, if that's what it was, that's you know, an easy one. A. But, um, two, it's entirely possible that regardless of what pronouns Mitski uses, Mitski may have said like, hey, maybe I don't feel very comfortable being called mother and and has said so publicly potentially and maybe that was a sort of violation of that rule potentially. Uh, or three, there is a pregnant pause, pardon the pun, that is happening at the beginning of this show. And that's just that's just etiquette. That's just show etiquette to like let the moment hang so that when the beat drops, it's more effective. You're 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 breaking the tension before Mitski has a choice to break the tension themselves. So I get I, is, I get that. <laughs> it is clear from the context of the video that Mitski is trying to achieve some kind of like dramatic silence yes. that somebody clearly interrupts. So maybe that's yeah. what's happening here. Yes, it is. It is. I feel like it is a similar violation of the Beyonce everybody on mute rule at, at the concerts 
chances are there will usually be somebody in the crowd going woo. It's 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 like doing a woo or clapping in the middle of a moment of silence. Like you just oh. you just don't. You just oh, don't. Now to your, now to your first question, mother is mothering. Um, what is interesting is that you pegged it as Gen Z slang, and I would um, use this platform that you have delightfully given me um, to say that I would love it if news articles showed a little bit more nuance in calling something Gen Z slang when a lot of the slang is actually the slang that is being used very specifically um, by queer folks and people of color that then gets co-opted and appropriated into the mainstream that then gets described as Gen Z slang. Therefore, let us take the language back to its actual roots. And mother is not Gen Z slang. It is actually queer slang that originated in the drag and ballroom scene. And mother, somebody who you would call mother is a a mother figure, an iconic feminine figure. So for example, a lot of drag queens would call RuPaul mother because it felt like Ru literally gave birth to this whole, you know, generations and generations of drag queens. And so a lot of iconic um, kind of uh, queer, iconic uh, pop figures or other, you know, kind of pop cultural figures would tend to be called mother in this situation if they have had a significant impact in the culture um, or if they uh, represented a kind of elder teaching the children sort of role in their community or if it's a place where maybe folks that didn't necessarily feel like they had a home felt like they could have a home in this person and what this person represents. So... Being called mother for me personally would be an immense honor. Hmm. But not while I'm trying to do my thing on stage. That's all. <laughs> y you professored the crap out of that. That was <laughs> dazzling to watch. Thank you. <laughs> I feel like I got like two credits toward a women's studies, queer <laughs> studies minor just from having listened to that. That was fantastic. And thank you for pointing out my ignorance on the intersectionality of it all it, it is much how travis kelsey's haircut is not the travis oh kelsey God. haircut right oh boy you know just yeah. completely uh you know just minimizing <laughs> the black experience by not acknowledging that it's a fade um you know certainly if this particular fra phrase has roots in the queer community that should be acknowledged rather than just doing what mainstream media is doing right now and saying oh yeah this is just gen z slang yeah, just like, oh, like, I the, the, there there are people that would extend to maybe like calling like Hillary Clinton mother in a like in a way that like, <laughs> like I don't necessarily know the the metaphor maybe does not necessarily extend in in certain situations. But yes, if if uh, somebody um, if if you are um, maybe feminine presenting um, or feminine carrying and somebody says oh my god you are so mother um then if if it is somebody who is you know kind of carrying that that kind of etymological weight along with saying that phrase um then i would personally take it as a compliment because it means that you have a sort of like um a, a wise gravitas uh to you um that uh, that is is maybe even considered influential to uh, to younger generations and so I, I would welcome being called mother, but I do feel like I would I would have to earn that uh, with with my actions and my deeds and my art. And I look forward to, I don't know, hopefully being mother someday. Someday. <laughs> someday. That's the goal. We're, we we I, we want that for you. Oh gosh, that that was that was quite helpful. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, just, that, I I I you, you caught me at a good time. I am all caught up on Drag Race. So. <laughs> oh, perfect. Well, yeah, you know. Max knowledge right now. That's great. So I want to get your perspective on something that we talked about last week on the show, Elisa. And as I was talking about it, all I could think was like, man, this seems like something that mm -hmm. Elisa might want to sink her teeth into. We're having, we're experiencing some real heavy duty, big tech versus big media drama right now. Yeah. With a UMG and TikTok. Just, we've never seen anything quite like this in the industry. It, you know, these two just giants in music just taking each other on saying like you know it's my job to underpay artists and they say no it's my <laughs> job to underpay artists hey thank you yeah and so 
just to catch everybody up on what's going on here, around February 1st, TikTok removed all of the music from Universal Music Group artists from its platform amidst a contract standoff between TikTok and UMG, the world's largest record label. That means if you go onto TikTok right now as we record this on February 8th, you cannot make any TikTok videos using Universal Music Group recordings. Um, any any videos that feature Universal Music Group recordings are now muted. That means Taylor Swift songs, BTS songs, Drake, Olivia Rodrigo, gone off the platform. And uh, it's also created this uh, crazy situation where now 15 of the top 50 uh, entries on the Billboard TikTok top 50 chart are no longer able to be used on TikTok right now because of this standoff. TikTok is, uh, or sorry, Universal is saying that the reason why we're doing this is that TikTok is you know significantly underpaying for mm. the use of music on its platform, mm -hmm. and we can't justify that anymore. Uh, also, uh, not mentioned, but they probably said under their breath was, "Hey, nobody underpays our artists but us." TikTok, how dare you? Let us buy a stake in your company so that we could just let's let's just turn you into Spotify. Well, that's the other thing, right? I mean, you you bring up a great point there, right? Is you never saw TikTok being upset about Spotify underpaying its artists, but UMG is also a shareholder in Spotify. So, you know, they had an interest in the in their artists getting underpaid, they're but they don't own a stake in TikTok. So now money. they're mad. It's not the artists. They're just mad that they're not getting their money because they don't have a share in the company. That's it. Yeah. That's all it is. And and meanwhile, to because I'm going to start this discussion by dumping on the labels first. And then we can dump on TikTok because there are there's no right person here. Like neither of these companies are doing right by the people that we care about on this program, which is the Absolutely. artists, the indie creators. But and so so really, it's both their faults that we're in this situation. You know, they're both right and they're both wrong. But uh, the problem with TikTok, or not the problem with what Universal's doing here, is they're they're you know they they say they're looking out for artists' interests, right? You know we by not paying us enough, we can't pay our artists, so we need to fight you so that we can get more money to our artists. But the problem is there are a lot of Universal Music Group artists that depend on TikTok to grow their brand, to grow their fan base, such that those fans will then go see them in concert and buy their merchandise and now without tiktok you know they are they've lost that space and they would gladly give up whatever tiny amount of a fraction of a fraction of royalties <laughs> that they were you know you know losing on tiktok if it means that they can still have that exposure to that tiktok audience i think the the best case study to demonstrate this elisa is what uh noah khan uh has been going through noah khan you know really really popular artist on tiktok every you know everybody you can't escape the song stick <laughs> season right it's everywhere um and he came out and and you know this this uh and he's a universal artist and this dispute could not have happened at a worse time for him because he's just about to promote a new single and suddenly all of the noah khan songs are nowhere to be found on tiktok which means like 85 percent of the tiktok videos he's made are now muted because they all have his music on them and so he's like oh great now i can't promote myself to my fans anymore because this is where my fans find me and now you've taken this away from me and you know just so you can have a contract dispute with tiktok so like this is hurting universal artists even though universal is saying we're here to fight for the artists now the other side of the argument is, yeah, so we, we said why Universal yeah. sucks in all of this. Yeah. TikTok sucks in all of this, too. All right. They, they don't get off easy because when Universal says you're not paying enough for our music, for all these Universal artists music, they are right. Mm -hmm. TikTok, e even by the paltry standards of, say, how much Spotify pays mm -hmm. artists for music, TikTok is way, 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 way way below even that very sad standard um i uh, to, and to help articulate this point elisa right before the show started i hastily put together what i like to call the saddest chart in music <laughs> oh great and the purpose of the saddest chart in music is to demonstrate how many how much money you get when your content is streamed a million times mm. on some of the major streaming platforms. And so Lauren, could you, uh, producer Lauren, could you pull up the, 
the uh, the saddest music oh. chart of all time for everybody. So for the people who are listening on the radio, I will walk people through the sad chart. Oh, but you can, but this chart awkward. helps to demonstrate why TikTok, despite being wrong in this too, because everybody's wrong. UMG is wrong. TikTok is wrong. TikTok's got something of a point here. <laughs> um, if you are on Spotify and your music is streamed a million times, you can expect as a music rights holder to get about four thousand dollars from that, somewhere between three to five tenths of a cent per stream. Nobody is saying that that's a particularly yeah. great payday, but when you compare it to some of the other digital forms of media out there, it's a damn uh, Scrooge McDuck money bin. Yeah. So compare that to say when music is played on YouTube, music right holders can get about a thousand dollars per million impressions, or about one tenth of a cent per stream. Now let's move to the sad world of TikTok in terms of how they pay creators on their platform. So we uh, a few months ago, at least, uh, Zach Sloan and I talked about how much creators can make on that platform through the Creator Fund. And thanks to some tweets by uh, all around wonderful human being Hank Green, we ah. all got an idea of how much video creators can make on TikTok, which ain't much. Uh, a million impressions on that platform can make a creator about a hundred bucks or, you know, less, you know, one tenth of what you make on YouTube for the same amount of impressions if you're a music rights holder or one fortieth of what you'd get if you were a musician on Spotify. So a hundred dollars for a million impressions. But that's if you are a creator on TikTok, like Hank Green making a TikTok <sighs> video. If your music is featured in a TikTok video. How much are you paid? Are you paid uh, three to five tenths of a cent per stream like you would if your music's on Spotify? No. Um, and in fact, it's very hard to get this number. This is an estimate from Billboard magazine. But according to Billboard, a music rights holder on TikTok for one million streams of their music can expect to make about $8. American eight. Yes. Eight mm. American dollars. Not even, not even a tenor. Mm. No, you can't even get a couple $5 foot longs with it. Wow. You know, contrast that with the $4,000 you would make as a music rights holder on Spotify, which again, ain't that it's much, no. <laughs> but is a fraction of a, but, but the, but what you get on TikTok is a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of that. So if I'm UMG, I have an argument here, <sighs> you know, yeah. like, cause, cause they're not even paying YouTube money. They're not even paying anything close to YouTube money. TikTok's position seems to be that, you know, everybody who's involved with our platform, whether you're a creator or a musician, we're basically like AM FM radio. We're paying you in exposure, <laughs> right? Oh this is like, we don't need to pay you because by being on our platform, uh, you're going to get opportunities to get your music streamed on Spotify. We'll make you famous. And so, you know, we don't have to pay for either the labor of uh, people performing on our platform or the music that we stream on this platform. And it's created a pretty significant imbalance that I don't think is sustainable. And I think UMG was just the first major label to call TikTok out on it. Which is wild because, of course, you know, would would they be the biggest? In terms of size, they're they're the, they're the world's yeah. largest record label. Yeah, well, there you go. That's you know, it's 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 kind of wild that you know the 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 biggest was the first, and you know, it'd be interesting to see what trickle down effect there is um, based on what the result of this is. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of curious when when it, that that video creators number. I'm wondering if maybe the solution now is for like a musician to have to like get an affiliate code for TikTok shop and sell some random thing because maybe selling some cheap random thing on Amazon and pointing people to that with an affiliate link might actually get them more money than sharing their art. And that's not depressing. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, I mean, that that is kind of where we're heading, right? Is I think TikTok with the launch of the TikTok shop is saying, if you're trying to monetize on our platform, that's the future. We are becoming an e-commerce platform where you can happen to watch. Baby. Yeah. 
And, I've always you know, wanted my own TVC show. <laughs> yeah, we, we're QVC, and then every once in a while you can see a video where somebody gets mad because they shouted, Mother is Mothering at a Mitski concert. <laughs> and, you know, I, I don't think that's a particularly great future. <laughs> but, um, and so I, I think the labels are going to push back. And what, what makes UMG a particularly, what, what allows them to be, to do com particularly significant amount of damage on TikTok in terms of what gets muted is not only are they a record label, but they are a publishing company that represents right. songwriters. And so not only do all the UMG recordings uh, get muted, but any song that has at least one UMG published songwriter on it wow. also could get muted because generally most of these platforms rely on getting every songwriter and publisher to sign off before a license is granted. So, I mean, that's a lot of music disappearing, which leads me to believe, and I, you know, we talked about this last week, this standoff won't remain forever. Both of these platforms no. have too much to lose by not working with each other. But, you know, it, but in the meantime, until they figure their crap out, the people who are really suffering are artists like Noah Khan, who have lost their connection point to their fans because these two, uh, you know, platforms want to have a, a peeing contest, if you will. <laughs> it's wild. Now, what, what what I have seen on my timeline, and this was actually like the way that I discovered this was happening, is because it was people making jokes on my timeline about like, you know, what life coach influencers sound like without umg music behind their <laughs> shilling um and their grift um and i was like oh really that's interesting but then you know the amount of artists that i follow on tiktok that i'm like all right here's a vacuum here's my music i'm not signed please feel free to use it um so silver lining question mark potentially for the unsigned um in this scenario and maybe an opportunity for you to get your stuff out while everything else is being muted. I'd love to see that. I mean, certainly I want all artists to succeed, but our platform exists to kind of really cape up for independent creators. And so if this, if this void gets filled by unsigned artists and, you know, because you don't have Taylor Swift and Olivia Rodrigo music yeah. anymore to, you know, I sync mean, up with like, if you, don't have i mean I, I don't know if paramore is a is a umg artist or not but i mean you know if, if if in case any of your olivia rodrigo gets muted if any paramore gets muted um if any like uh, Beach going. bunny gets muted um if any mitski gets muted or boy genius um or any of your favorite 80s hair metal artists um mm -hmm. i have some great news about a band called crimson echoes <laughs> Please, please, please stream them and, and make is your music with, with is your music actually songs. available for streaming yeah. uh, sync on TikTok? Yeah, it should be. What's weird though is that I can't. I don't know that I have control over like how much is available for people to use because I keep trying to make videos with my own stuff and I keep wanting to highlight different parts of my own tune and I can't, um, which is like very maddening. Um, but yes, Crimson Echoes tunes are available for use in your TikTok videos and your Instagram reels. That's so. what we need. We we need some random Gen Zer out there to find like a six second clip of one of your songs that fits perfectly with some like funny recurring meme yeah. bit, and then you know then like a billion videos get made and it takes over the platform and you make eight dollars. And that <laughs> is how I become mother. <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, on your path to reaching mother is mothering status, <laughs> you are, every time we have you on the show, you come to us with like some pretty cool stories of how your own career in acting and VO and music continue to progress. And I love that, you know, the longer we do the, the career update segment with you, I feel like the more ground you're covering, the more things you have to report. And so that's a really, really good sign. So before we go to break, Rock Doc, could you give us a little career update? What have you been up to? Sure, absolutely. So auditioning, 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 of course, um, because as as any actor will tell you, auditioning is the job and you get to play. And if you end up getting booked and end up getting a check for it, then, well, that's just a bonus. 
But auditioning really is the work. Um, so I've 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 been auditioning. Um, I have an audiobook um, at some point that is going to send me the manuscript so that I can start reading and narrating. So look out maybe sometime um, this summer for uh, for some more young adult um, queer fiction. Um, so super excited um, and. Um, last time I was here, I think I mentioned that I auditioned and got booked the same day for this awesome industrial, uh, gig, um, sort of industrial, but kind of not an industrial thing is something that's sort of like for internal use only, um, like a company video or something used for their website. But this is something that may or may not, if you're in Texas or it's in the Southwest region, I have no idea. Um, maybe I don't know what theaters this might be showing in, um, but potentially sometime before Nicole Kidman says heartbreak feels good in a place like this, um, you might <laughs> see me uh, <laughs> uh, dancing, um, dancing around um, about uh, certain carbonated beverages and how happy I am to be delivering these carbonated beverages all around the Southwest region. This was a shoot that has been my longest shoot so far. It was one day of rehearsals and then three shoot days Whoa. of rehearsal day because, baby, these were three different videos that were musical parodies that involved lip syncing, which I love, and actual choreography Whoa. <laughs> with, with real life, you know, beautiful professional dancers behind us um doing stuff and i am five six seven eighting and i am pot of and that is something that i have not done in decades <laughs> what was that experience like how did you handle choreography because i mean I, i've oh known God. you since we were itty bitty and you know you 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 have lots of talent in a lot of different areas and i'm not saying you're a bad dancer because you're not but <laughs> I've never sort of like, you know, when, when I've made like my list of adjectives about like think, you know, it's I've never been like, oh, great dancer, Barishnikov. Like typically she's a mover. <laughs> she's <laughs> she's a mover. Um, but I was actually really excited to get into the choreography. I think because they they hired very clearly actors and dancers. Um, they knew that the actors you know, maybe didn't necessarily have to put in, you know, we're, we're, we're not like PK turning, you know, and going into the splits, you know, or anything, thankfully, but they did give us a decent amount of it. And I was rusty at first, but it was really exciting, like how much I was able to retain and basically just tap right back into that, like freshman year, Greece, pink lady, number six, you know, <laughs> situation it was it was really fun to get back to musical theater to the point where uh two of our shoot days were at a local theater huge stage very modern theater hazers lights drone shots and a jib and alternate shots and but i'm on a stage and i'm waiting in the wings and one of my fellow actors you know after i get a call be like hey elisa we can see you can you just like back up a few feet one of my fellow actors leans over to me and goes, if you can see the audience, they can see you. And ah. I just got <laughs> the chills. I, I was I was right back there. I was right back there. Um, and it it made me realize, like, what kinds of work I really do love doing um, and being an absolute ham where the only direction is um, if you think it's big enough, it's not. I'll tell you when it's too big, that is the room. That Play to I the back to of the theater. <laughs> I loved to be in that room and I and I loved being um, in the theater and I loved hearing musical theater nerds vocalizing in the background between takes. <laughs> and um, it was it was a real treat. I only just stopped being sore from the dancing and oh. all the takes and everything. Um, but I, I don't know when it's going to come out, but as soon as it does and I can get my hands on a copy, I will absolutely send it because of all of the things I've done. This is the th one of the things that I am the most proud of in on, on my on-camera career, at least for sure, hands let down. Me, let me ask you this, and this might be a tricky question to answer because it's, it's sort of like trying to define what's undefinable, but 
as you've done these career updates every month that you come on, I can tell that like the pace of accomplishment is increasing. I mean, I mean, you know, the the career update that you do like six or seven months ago was like, you know, I got two auditions this week instead of one. Um, and and now like you're you're on stage and you're doing commercials with Dak Prescott and all of the stuff that's going on. And so just like, how does it feel for you in the moment? I've known you for 20 years. I know that you've wanted this kind of thing your whole life. And, you know, you went back to school, you did the academic route, and then later in life said, I want to make a go of this. And you're starting to see traction now. Like, what does that mean for you? It's, it's huge. And it's incredibly validating. Um, because it, it makes me feel like, like this is just a thread that I've been kind of pulling my entire life and I'm finally actually like taking myself seriously as an artist. Everybody, if you are an artist, I will probably say this every single time I'm here, but I highly recommend going through The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron um, and sort of that book and the exercises within that book. And it's about kind of unblocking your creative self and since going through that book and identifying like what what it is that my blocks have been and a lot of it has been like fear of being too old fear of being too late um fear of being not trained enough fear of being trained incorrectly um all of these things so much um that has been stopping me from creating and pursuing and and taking this kind of thing seriously has been fear um and, you know, like like all of these, you know, kind of demons from the past that like to kind of talk to you um, and, and kind of talk you into being safe. Um, but I've been kind of chipping away at that very gradually over the last, say, like eight months. Going to acting class has been absolutely instrumental in that, too, um, because then I also get that like weekly validation, you know, from a teacher and, and my cohort like, no, I am. I am on a good track and I do belong here and hearing feedback from my fellow actors, like, you know, one of the dancers coming up to me after that gig and going, you're good, you know? And I was like, Oh, <laughs> that's, that's awesome. One of these days I will believe it. Um, I'm, I'm getting closer <laughs> and you know how long that process has been about, you know, like, like, like it has been a, 30 year long project I mean, to I mean, take a compliment. <laughs> yeah. Knowing your particularly deep and passionate relationship with imposter syndrome, like you're going to be the last one to believe it. Yeah. <laughs> like you're going to be standing up there with like your second Academy Award in the same night and being like, are you sure? Fully egot it. And I'll be like, but the Pulitzer, but the Pulitzer, <laughs> but the Pulitzer. Um, oh, yeah. I that P got man. Yeah, it's it's like the the amount of um, auditions I get from casting directors that are repeats, which means that, hey, maybe I wasn't right for the thing before, but they want to see me again. Um, and like internalizing like those like kind of internal compliments and like bits of feedback, even though, you know, you're not always going to get the you should be an actor. You would be very, very good at this. You should apply yourself to this. I think you're really good. I'm never going to get that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like lessons. little little touch points along the way that tell you like there's there's a there here. And just the way that I feel when I'm doing it. I'm doing the work I want to do and I'm sending in the auditions that I want to send in and it just keeps feeding on itself. Um, and it's great. Um, I'm still looking for a day job, <laughs> you know, like it's not, it's not all sunshine. Like I'm very excited to find out, you know, if I have runway for the next two months, you know, so I'm looking for a part-time job to supplement all this. Right. But at the same time, when it comes to the work that I'm doing, I am very happy and I don't know what the ceiling is, but I could just hope that I can keep going for as long as is humanly possible. It's going to be a fun ride in the meantime. How can you not be inspired by that if you're an indie creator out there? I know I know everybody's smiling for you. Uh, very, very great news to hear. And we can't wait to hear what the next update's going to bring. <laughs> and I, I like to think these career update segments are really helping your career because... 
it gives you like one month in between appearances that you have to oh. like do stuff in your career so that you have I things to share with us. I love a deadline. Um, <laughs> I will procrastinate. So, so, you know, I'm, I'm just hauling ass to try to get booked just so I have something to talk about. There you go. Yeah. Love it. <laughs> Let's take a break. We're going to have our guest, Sasha Pisterman, uh, publicist extraordinaire joining us uh, on break the business. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Break the Business is presented in cooperation with Ryan A. Carella, PA. Ryan A. Carella, PA is a law firm providing transactional entertainment legal services, including contracts, business formation, commercial law, copyright, trademark, and more. Ryan A. Carella, PA, Miami, Florida. RKPALaw.com. Streaming services for Break the Business provided by L.E.K. Entertainment. L.E.K. Entertainment is a full-service entertainment company offering everything from consultations to full-scale events and productions, including audio and video productions, voiceovers, staged theatrical productions, script and music development, and streaming services. For more information, visit lekentertainment.com. L.E.K. Entertainment wants to help you bring your story to life. Thanks for supporting Break the Business. If you have a question or topic that you want us to discuss, email us at breakthebusiness at gmail.com. You can follow the host, that's me, on Twitter at Ryan K-A-I-R, and you can follow the show at The BTV Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the show on Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook, and on all major podcast platforms. And now, let's get back to the show. Welcome back to Break the Business, you lovely humans. Uh, <laughs> Uh, John Taylor writes in, Thank while you. I'm here, I must simply compliment the doc on her eye makeup. Um, I mean, Thank not you. just the eye makeup, the whole setup. I know how much work she puts into this, and Thank it you. looks dazzling. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes, indeed. All right, let's go ahead and bring out our guest this week. Ryan Carell is here with Elisa Rock Doc, <laughs> and our guest this week is a prominent music publicist and the founder of SDP Digital, a PR agency with a focus on using strategic storytelling to reach multicultural audiences. Mm -hmm. Our guest's new online course is the Complete Music PR Playbook. It's available now, and you can find out more about our guest's work by visiting www.sdp-digital.com. We are happy to welcome Sasha Pisterman on to Break the Business. Hi, Sasha. Hi, thank you for having me. Hi. We are overjoyed to be speaking with you, Sasha. Your mission statement. I, I love this. I was drawn into it right away. Strategic storytelling to reach multicultural audiences. Who could be against that? Tell us how that really terrific mission statement drives your approach to PR for musicians. Um, well, my entire career, I've worked with uh, mainly Latin and black talent. So um, multicultural was always kind of the foundation of what I was doing. And there is kind of a stigma uh, with those types of artists that once they reach a certain level, they no longer want to talk to the more ethnic media. Mm. And a lot of them will have certain, you know, types of publicists that work at the larger firms that steer them away from that as well. Um, so for me, I think it's it's very important to still make sure that these artists are connecting with those types of publications and with those audiences and not kind of leaving them behind once they go, you know, mainstream. Well, that's a really interesting perspective. And, you know, that is something that we often see a lot. And it's a strategy that I do see way too many publicists who represent entertainers of color to pursue. But it sounds like you take the opposite approach. You yeah. make sure you tell your clients, don't forget about the outlets that brought you here and make sure you keep those lines of communication open. Absolutely. Wow, that's Absolutely. a that's terrific. I want to talk to you, Sasha, about a story that came out from the company Chart Metric. This just broke um, yesterday, I believe, as we record this, and wanted to get a publicist perspective on it. So, uh, Chart Metric is this company that collects a ton of data about artists and about music and about tracks and recording and everything. They, like, and some of the insights they come up with are pretty wild. And one of their things that they just came out with in their year-end 2023 report is they broke down artists into multiple categories. Uh, the lowest in terms of exposure is undiscovered, then developing, mid-level, 
mainstream and superstar was the highest. And so they wanted to look at over the course of the year, how many artists can go from undiscovered to superstar, the true rags to riches story, the kind of thing that you're trying to do as a publicist, or at least try to get them to like that mid-level maybe. And the statistic that they came out with was kind of sobering. They said um, in 2023, of the uh, of all of the artists that were considered undiscovered at the start of the year, only 0.1% of that group made it to either mid-level, mainstream, or superstar. The remaining 99.9% stayed in either that undiscovered or developing category. Do, does a statistic like that surprise you? Uh, when you hear something like that, what does that mean for the work you do in PR? It doesn't because, um, you know, I immediately just think about the amount of volume that, you know, we see as far as artists putting out music. Um, I think, I forgot what the statistic was, maybe like 60,000 songs are uploaded a day or something like that. So I think once you look at kind of the, the bigger picture with how many new artists are coming out now because of the accessibility that the internet has given everyone, um, I, I'm not surprised that such a, a low number is able to kind of uh, make it through. Well, with that kind of saturation, how does that affect the work that you do? What do you do with a, a developing artist, with an undiscovered artist, to try to get them to break through the clutter when there's so much new music getting added every day? Um, I would say where I differ with other publicists is um, I have an ear for music. <laughs> I'll be in the studio with the artists. Uh, I also have a publishing background. I came from my father worked in the Latin music industry. So I really know music. So when I have had, you know, unsigned artists approach me, um, the first thing I do is I want to hear your music. So if I think the music is good and there's something there, then I kind of look at the overall bigger picture. What does your social media look like? Do you have some type of brand developed? Do you know who you are as an artist? Um, and do you have some type of buzz, even if it's just local? And then from there, I can kind of start to position them and talk to them about their life and their story and pull out like different angles that I can use for media. Um, so I've been able to get like lifestyle type of publications. Um, I had one artist on Univision, like the morning news. Um, so I'm able to kind of like create these narratives for these artists. So I'm not just focused on trying to get them in billboard or rolling stone. And then from there, I start building on that. And so I'll, I'll do more of the, um, the genre specific publications and, you know, continue to grow it from there. Interesting. Now you, you mentioned kind of these, these publications and everything, and it kind of reminded me of, I have a lot of friends that work in media and journalism seems to be seeing a huge crisis with publications being taken over, shut down, pitchfork, um, RIP pitchfork, <laughs> RIP pitchfork. Um, and so you mentioned kind of these more sort of niche genre publications. Do you find that that is kind of going to be the future of where you're going to be sending out these pitches or in terms of publications, are there also like alternate methods of getting these stories out there with all sorts of media places becoming more and more inaccessible? Yeah, I think that to address, uh, you know, the media industry right now, yeah, it's the past, I would say like five years, it's just changed so much and all of these layoffs are crazy. Um, and, you know, all of these media companies are suffering and they need money coming in. So what they're really trying to do is sell advertising. Um, so 10 years ago, I was able to get an independent artist in billboard in complex in, you know, a larger publication and they were able to take the chance on that coverage, but now they need those clicks. So they're only covering, you know, the big artists. Um, so yeah, I think more niche publications, genre specific, local press, um, like I said, kind of like figuring out what the artist's story is outside of music and utilizing that as an angle and then owned your own channels. So mm. YouTube, um, your social media, creating the content to tell your story and to amplify it is super important. And it's great because you own that, you can control it, you can you know, decide 
how you're going to roll out an album, what you want people to see about it, like behind the scenes or, you know, what story you're really going to tell. When you bring on a new client, particularly one that's you know still developing or, or you know completely new, how much of what you have to do at the start of that engagement is helping them get their house in order like you brought up? Like before we can even pitch you to anything, we got to get your website right so that when they look you up, they don't just see like a blank page that's under construction. We got to get your socials ready. We got to get, you know, EPK. Talk, talk about that process. Yeah, it's definitely a heavier lift with newer artists. Um, but I will say some of them do kind of have it together already. Like there are some that are very um, knowledgeable and, and more business focused. So they do have that foundation laid out. But when they don't, uh, I focus on the visuals. Um, so like you said, the social media, let's shoot some new press photos. Let's put together, you know, media kit, a well-written bio for you just everything that we can utilize to present you, you know, to the media and to audiences, let's make sure that that is on point before we start the pitching. What should artists look for with a, in a publicist for the mm -hmm. artists out there who are interested in working with somebody like you and see, there's probably, you know, a lot of folks out there in this line of work. What are some of the things that they should look for that make them know, okay, this is somebody I should definitely be working with. Um, I would say find someone who works within your genre. I think that's super important because they have those relationships built with those journalists and bloggers. Um, a, the number one thing I would warn people about is stay away from any publicist that says that they can guarantee you any type of press coverage mm. because mm. we cannot guarantee press coverage. Um, regardless of if we're best friends with the editor of... <laughs> you know, Rolling Stone, it still might not happen. So anyone that is saying that they can guarantee it, they're either just lying to get your money or they're doing pay to play, which mm. is very unethical. And usually the, the types of publications that do that aren't ones that are gonna move the needle for you anyway. So I would say, um, watch out for that and then see what type of press coverage they've landed for other clients. Um, oh, yeah. See if they're, if you feel like they're genuinely interested in you, your story and your music. In terms of, you know, staying away from any publicist that's going to guarantee you success, mm -hmm. because obviously the PR game is, you know, one of a lot of uncontrolled variables. How much of what you have to do when you bring on a client, particularly one who's never worked with a publicist before, is manage their expectations, you know, make them understand what the possible <laughs> realistic outcomes are from the engagement? Yeah, that's always a struggle. Um, <laughs> <laughs> everyone thinks that, you know, their story deserves to be on the front cover of, you know, whatever. Um, but it's just a matter of like, I really, I spend a lot of time with them and I really break down, you know, my thought process about why I'm doing things a certain way. And I tell them like, look, this is a buildup. This is a long-term process. It's going to take time to get you the right press coverage and to uh, go from, you know, the local to the regional to the national publications. And I think once it's kind of broken down like that and explained, they get it. I do have uh, a great many more PR questions for you, as I know Elisa Rockdoc was, and I'm, I'm going to mm -hmm. let you ask uh, the next question, Elisa. But before we get to any more PR questions, oh, yeah. I saw in your uh, in the questionnaire you sent us, Sasha, that you like to cook. <gasps> and whenever a prospective guest tells us that they like to cook, I like to ask this mm -hmm. question. And maybe uh, Elisa can uh, give her answer as well. We can go around the room here. <laughs> What is your most controversial food opinion? Oh boy. What is the food opinion you have that like you, you swear by and people would think you're a crazy rebel for bringing it up. Um, I'll get yours too, Elisa, but let's start with our guests first. Cause it seems like you probably have a lot at Lisa, but. Um, I don't know if it's that crazy, but once I was out eating with friends and, um, I dipped my French fries in ketchup and then in the ranch and I mixed it. Whoa! And they were, like they looked at me crazy and like, oh my god, that's disgusting! Like, who does that? And I was like, I like it. It's good. 
Like, I was literally going to say mayo ketchup, like mayonnaise and ketchup. <laughs> and like, I have gotten the funkiest looks from people when I'm like, can I get a little side of mayo? And then I do the poop poop and I did yeah. the thing. I'm like, I grew up on that. <laughs> yeah. I yeah, mean, on one crazy. hand, like in, in Sasha's defense, on one hand, like we think ketchup and ranch dressing, it's like, oh, those, you know, going together kind of weird. But isn't that just a liquid salad? <laughs> you know, you put tomatoes in a salad, you put ranch dressing on a salad. Why can't you combine ketchup and ranch together? I'm I'm down for this. Yeah, you're right. Actually, that's that's what I'm gonna say next time. So there you go. You know? <laughs> if ranch can go on a tomato, it can go on ketchup. Damn straight. Um, and you know, you, you, French fries is just a potato salad. <laughs> Exactly. Um, well, all right. Let me ask you, Rock Doc, your most controversial food opinion. I, uh, I'm, I am a, um, I am a hardliner for real sugar Coca Cola. Mm -hmm. Um, I am a, am a Coca Cola girl. I'm a Coca Cola classic. Um, kind of, kind of gal. Um, Pepsi is okay. <laughs> <laughs> when 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 it comes out of a properly syruped, you know, fountain kind of spray nozzle situation, if it's not syrupy, is I'm very particular about about stuff. Um, they they need to bring back Butterfinger BBs. Uh, they, Ooh, <laughs> hell yes, I have many opinions. Um, cereal is next great snack. I have very strong opinions about cereal. This could be an entire podcast episode. We're going to have a special edition that's all about food, and I will let the chopper spray then. <laughs> but until as, then a I'm publicist, <laughs> as a publicist, uh, I would advise you to say you love Pepsi as well. Yes. Mm, you. That's a fair point. That's you, true. Ne you never know who's coming with the check someday. That's true. That is exactly. true. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure how convincing the commercial is going to be when it's you in front of the camera going, Pepsi is okay. It's Pepsi. Pepsi is okay. Pepsi <laughs> is more than okay. Crystal Pepsi, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But oh Pepsi my God. is okay. So bring back I'll bring up mine real quick before we, we go back with the PR questions here. Um, I... I get a lot of people upset at me about this, particularly like, you know, masculine, manly men who swear mm. by this is like the ultimate food. But when it comes to beef products, I like burgers more than steaks. Oh, that's and fine. That's no, it's not. You say that's fine. When I say that in front of certain crowds of people, they think I'm being sacrilegious. It's like, oh, it's, what, you don't like a steak? Like a big manly steak? You know, a, a steak? Yeah, it's great. And then they always say this same thing. Well, you know, if you don't like steaks more than burgers, it's because you're not eating good enough steak. And it's like, yeah, if I have to eat a $100 version of the food to make it as good as the $9 burger, then you're not better than burgers. Because... I can get a reliable burger. Yeah. It is, I, I have had steak messed up for me so many times the, that are chewier than the sole of a shoe. I, right. I, I don't want to chance it. I don't want to chance yeah. it. I, 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 everything I has to be right for the steak to be good. You need, like, you got to, you, you need a skilled grill master. You know, it's got to be the right kind of beef. Meanwhile, like you can just grab like any kind of frozen beef, cook too long on the grill, <laughs> over burnt, and you put that on a bun with ketchup and like, you don't even need to heat the cheese. Just like grab a Kraft Singles right out of the fridge. It's going to be delicious. So, I mean, the people who are like team steak on this, I don't see yeah. it. Take a also trip to Argentina. Argentina. We'll change your mind. Oh yeah, but see, like if I if I have to ch if I have to change hemispheres <laughs> just to get a good steak, that says something about steak. But yes, I I I, I, I you know I've had Argentinian steak; it is yes. delightful. Mm -hmm. Um, tell us, Sasha, about the complete music PR playbook. I love these kind of courses. Artists get so much out of them. Yeah, so I had the idea a while back because. Um, over time, I started working with more and more indie artists, and a lot of them would approach me um, because they wanted me to kind of, you know, do the same thing that I was doing with other artists, building them up. They were getting uh, major label deals, but 
of course, I can't work with everyone. And the majority of them were not ready and they were not at the level to hire PR. So um, last year I started putting together this course and I really just went in and I looked at my process from front to end and I just kind of put it all together and I created templates, worksheets. Um, I'm really like guiding you through everything that I do when working with an artist and teaching you really how to figure out how to position yourself, how to create your message and how to reach out to media. Excellent. I, I love these kinds of courses because like I'm currently in an acting class with a casting director who is basically like, I'm going to show you how to make my job easier. Um, and and I almost feel like that's sort of, I love that approach from, from a sort of publicist being like, help me help you. <laughs> <laughs> so what, is, what is the most sort of like common headache as a publicist that if you could just like, and this might overlap with the final question potentially, but what is the one thing that if you could just have a megaphone and be like, please stop doing this, or please, I just wish everybody could do this. It would make my job so much easier. What would it be? God, this is such a good question. The number one thing I see is people spamming with links to stream their project or links to their music video. Um, I get so many messages, so many tweets, and it's literally just a link. And I'm like, oh, number one, I don't know who you are. Number two, what do you want me to do with this? Uh, and then I'll, I'll go to some of their profiles and it's literally just pictures of cover art back to back to back. Like there's no context. There's no storytelling. Like they haven't figured out who they are or what their brand is. So I would tell every artist, like figure out your brand before you do anything else. Mm. Oh, I can, that, that makes a lot of, I mean, what does that process look like out of curiosity? If I am, if I am the kind of artist who is nothing more than links and a couple pictures of my cover <laughs> art, what can I do? What exercises should I be conducting to figure out what my brand is and to learn how to present mm. it to people like you? Well, in my course, I guide you through a number of questions <laughs> Nice <laughs> to help you figure it out. But um, <laughs> no, there, there's, uh, there's a couple of questions that I always ask that to me are very telling. Uh, number one I ask them is, if you could have any artist career, whose career would you want? Because um, that kind of, to me, that kind of guides how I need to uh, approach the project, what their goals are, and how they see themselves too. And then the other thing I ask them: Where do you want people to be listening to your music? Is this what they're mm -hmm. listening to when they're getting dressed to go out, when they're in the car driving to work, when they're feeling down and they need some motivation? Um, like, where does your music fit into people's lives? What does it make them feel? Because at the end of the day, that's really what your brand is. How do you connect with people and how do you make them feel? Our guest that's has really been- really powerful. Yeah. <laughs> Our guest has been Sasha Pisterman. She's a publicist and the founder of SDP Digital PR Agency with a focus on using strategic storytelling to reach multicultural audiences. Find out more about our guest's work by visiting sdp-digital.com and check out her course, the complete music PR playbook. Sasha, before we let you go, we got one last question for you. Do you have any last tips for the indie creators out there to help them move their careers forward? Um, I would say make sure that with each release, you're being intentional about telling a story. Um, I'm still very pro albums. I know we're like in a single dominated mm -hmm. industry right now, but I think especially for indie artists, albums are super important and yeah like approach each one with a theme uh you know get new photos taken make sure the cover art is reflective of you know the content within the music and just really figure out what you want to portray to your audience and um yeah do vlogs behind the scenes content like get creative Sasha, thank you so much for your perspective. In honor of the amazing advice that you gave our viewers and listeners this week, I am going to order a plate of French fries tomorrow and I will devour them 
<laughs> with equal parts ketchup and ranch dressing mm. because it's just liquid salad. And so all of your critics just need to leave you alone, dang it. Because not only are your culinary tastes on point, but your advice to the indie creators out there is equally solid. We really appreciate you joining us this week, Sasha. Thank and uh, please don't be a stranger. We'd love to have you on again real soon. We need this good info. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. Our thanks to Sasha Pisterman. Oh, you know what? Actually, no, I don't want to do the R thanks yet. We got about a minute left, Elisa oh, Rock Doc. Can you give me like 60 seconds on what's going on with video games right now? Uh, digital theme parks. You, I know you're obsessed with Power oh World. Okay. Um, I would love to chat with you offline about the copyright slash IP implications of Power World. And that is going to be a story for another week. Um, I am enjoying playing it a lot, actually, because it's more than just a Pokemon ripoff. It is actually closer to Breath of the Wild and Ark survivalist things. And also you can make a Pokemon a flamethrower in Power World. Um, and also, uh, Disney has invested $1.5 billion into Epic Games um, to essentially build uh, digital theme parks. And I feel like the future is now with a lot of the experiments that they've done with Rocket League and Harmonix, um, where you can actually race in Rocket League under the banner of Fortnite. So two, I imagine that you will be able to play literally the Cars universe as a racing game and be Lightning McQueen in your own race, um, as well as having worlds dedicated to Avatar um, and Star Wars, et cetera. Um, this feels like the true um, kind of journey towards the metaverse, quote unquote, that I feel like has already existed, but this is just one of these sort of biggest leaps that has been taken. I feel like Meta was never the company that we should have been looking at vis-a-vis -vis metaverse things. It always should have been not just Epic Games, but just very specifically Fortnite. Um, Fortnite is the future. It is also very, very scary <laughs> in a lot of different <laughs> ways. Um, enjoy your um, Mickey-shaped ice cream cone in um, our dystopian capitalist hellscape love you guys <laughs> on that note our thanks to elisa rock doc our thanks to sasha pisterman producer lauren and thanks to all of you viewers and listeners for checking out break the business we'll see you next week